we're going to take a look at the challenges the payments industry is facing. Friction is a major cause of concern, but much of this comes from avoidable errors like formatting issues and typos. Payment pre-validation utilizes application programming interfaces or APIs to help validate key information before a payment is sent. The result? Frictionless payments, fewer delays and more importantly, happier customers. We're joined now by Nicholas Su, Regional Head of Payment Products, Global Payments Solutions Asia at HSBC. And he's here to join, he's joining us to explore pre-validation and how it can help minimize payment friction. Hi, thanks so much uh, for taking the time to be with us, Nicholas. Good morning, very nice to see you. So let's talk about some of the key problem statements in cross-border payments today. Thank you. Um, I guess the downside of doing this on day four is that I'm probably not going to tell you anything that you haven't already heard, and I'm also losing my voice. But the upside is we probably, as an industry, need to hear this often enough you know, mm -hmm. before we finally move. Friction in cross-border payments, right? Uh, fantastic topic. Uh, and I think the way I think about it, Janela, is that I kind of split them into two large camps. Uh, on camp number one, you kind of have your big, messy, hard problems and on camp number two I kind of look at it from a own goal or kind of shoot yourself in the foot <laughs> perspective right so I'll start on the harder messier problems uh, I, I kind of think of them in three three categories the first is uh, exchange and capital controls and as, as you're probably familiar with, with good reason uh, especially where I'm from many Asian markets actually still uh, maintain exchange and capital controls especially post the 97 crisis uh, and how this actually manifests itself is that there's a lot of complexity when banks are looking to process incoming payments, right? It could be the need for a document check. It could be the need to ensure that the purpose of payment is correct. And you can't, this problem is kind of exacerbated when different banks kind of adopt the local rules, you know, that their central banks or their regulators set slightly differently. So that's certainly uh, one big pain point. Uh, another pain point is the lack of a true 24-7 uh, real-time payment infrastructure. Many market infrastructures, say the RTGS in most countries, are not 24-7. And instances where a market has adopted a 24-7, say, real-time payments solution, a lot of the real-time payment solutions do not natively allow for incoming cross-border uh, transactions, be it on a technology standpoint, a formatting standpoint, or even from whether the scheme governance rules actually allow it. Uh, the third uh, and final problem uh, in this case would be sanctions. Don't get me started on sanctions. There was a fantastic panel, I think, with the Wolfsburg Group uh, a couple of days back. And one stat which really stuck with me was that more than 99% of sanction hits are actually false positives. So mm. I think the industry as a whole, right, I think there's a lot more we can do there. And I think the, the reason why I'm painting this picture is that these are big, messy problems, as I said earlier. I think the industry recognizes it, but these are things that are going to take some time. Mm. I think to the point on you know, Prevail today, and I think, Johnny, you mentioned it perfectly, you kind of done my job for me by introducing it, is that um, there are a lot of formatting and typo errors. And as I said, it's kind of shooting yourself you know, in the mm. foot. So I'm really happy Swift has stepped up uh, you know, to the plate to help us address this jointly as an industry. Okay, so I've, I've set you up and I'll let you knock it down now. These are the pain points, these are the, the, the hiccups, the roadblocks. Uh, but how does Swift payment pre-validation look to solve these issues then? Are we doing the long version or the short version? Let's go for the medium <laughs> version. Medium, medium version. Let's split the difference. Uh, okay. Um, I think for me, the clue is in the name, right? So pre-validate. Mm -hmm. So in this instance, you are, it's as simple as you are doing a check uh, on the beneficiary details before the payment is actually processed. And for those of you from the UK, it's very similar to confirmation of payee. Uh, in Asia, quite a few of the markets have also built something similar into their real-time payment scheme. So. Again, we can get into technical details of, you know, is it the basic uh, beneficiary account validation? Is it the SwiftLet uh, central, uh, you know, Benny account validation? Swift has also launched like the contextual validation, but simpl you know, simplistically put, it's just about doing that check up front. And it's actually easy for me to say that, you know, these are self-inflicted wounds, but until Swift actually stepped to the plate, there was no one party who was orchestrating all of the various different banks on the network to help one another communicate and to pre-validate. So I think it's a very useful step, you know, that SWIFT has actually started. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage, you know, all banks to join the party. And what about HSBC? How, how is HSBC using pre-validation capability? Okay. So I think we're doing it in a phased manner and we're phasing it across both our participation model as well as the uh, customer channel initiation. And I'll elaborate briefly on both. From a participation model standpoint, I think 
there are two broad roles. You can be a consumer and you can be a responder. So from a consumer standpoint, all that means is as a remitting bank, I'm giving my clients the option to pre-validate whether or not the information is correct. So in this case, we're connecting to SWIFT, who in turn connects with the beneficiary bank to validate whether the information, say the uh, beneficiary account name or the account number is actually accurate or is the bank account actually open. So that's one perspective from a consumer. A responder is simply the opposite. So the responder is the bank that's responding back to the call from SWIFT to validate whether or not the information is correct. So we've actually, we piloted this, if I'm not wrong, in UAE uh, a couple of years back. And we then, you know, upon uh, some initial success from the pilot, we have scaled this as a consumer, if I'm not wrong, to pretty much every single market where HSBC is present, maybe barring one or two uh, slightly more challenging markets. And on the responder side, uh, I think we have about seven or eight markets now, but the markets where we're seeing the bulk of our volume, so we have Hong Kong Live, we have US, UK, and a few other large markets. And if I'm not wrong, by the end of the year, that number should be closer to 30 as well. So I think we're really looking to drive that industry adoption because as we like to say, payments is a team sport and you kind of need the network effect. So that's on the participation model side. On the uh, client channel initiation side, we have started with HSBC Net, which is our global internet banking channel. That's where the bulk of the transactions come from. But as and when clients tell us, hey, you know, uh, HSBC, we would like perhaps to initiate via APIs, or some clients are on host to host. I think we're in the midst of co-creating and listening to our client feedback there as well. So people watching this uh, at home, they're considering, the bank's considering joining SWIFT's uh, payment pre-validation. What advice would you give to them? Uh, you've got your soapbox. Uh, what, what advice would you throw to them? Join now, don't wait. <laughs> uh, but on a serious note, and we did this uh, as well, I think it's really important to be data-led, right? And what I mean by data-led is, I mean, it could be the bank's own data, it could be speaking to SWIFT about, you know, kind of leveraging their data. It's important to choose kind of which corridors where you're seeing volume. It's important to look at which corridors or which client segments where you are facing that friction, right? Are you having a high rate of rejects or returns? And I think, you know, that kind of gives you uh, the best way to select your pilot market. And once you kind of see that initial success, just like what we did, you can then kind of look to, you know, you can look to scale that out. I think the other thing which, again, is quite uh, dear to my heart uh, from a product management standpoint is that we cannot assume that once you kind of launch, you know, your shiny new widget, you know, on your internet banking channel, that people know what to do with it or that people are, you know, uh, or clients, you know, actually want to uh, click on it. So I think what we did was we really had a very concerted effort in communicating this both internally within HSBC. It's like, it's like breakfast talks, it's, you know, uh, internal talk shows, uh, many, many email blasts as well as to certain uh, clients. So it was broad-based commercialization. We did LinkedIn posts. Uh, you know, and I think we even, for a lot of our key clients, going back to my point on being data-led, we also contacted them specifically to tell them, hey, we have this, you know, we have this new feature uh, and it's proven to be you know, really helpful in minimizing friction. So I think that that was the journey that we went on. Uh, as I said, payments is a team sport and I'm very happy right, if any of the banks want to speak reach out to HSBC or myself to kind of share our journey in a bit more detail. Nicholas, we're so glad you came to chat with us about something, as you say, you've been chatting about all week, and, and uh, we hope uh, uh, your voice recovers from uh, all the conversations Thank you've been having. <laughs> Thank you. Nicholas Su, Regional Head of Global Payment Solutions Asia at HSBC. Thanks for your time and enjoy your final day here at Sunbox. Thank you so much. Thank you.